Welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome, Gregor, especially. Uh, my name is uh, Stefano Gennarini. I am the Vice President for Legal Studies at the Center for Family and Human Rights. And um, I'm bringing you today uh, to uh, Gregor Popenk, who is the President of the European Center for Law and Justice. Gregor is um, a real expert on human rights internationally, and in particular on the European system, the European human rights system and European institutions. He is a tremendous lawyer and scholar, and he has years of experience working with European human rights and institutions as well as the United Nations system. I really don't know uh, any, of anyone else who has his depth of experience, both as a scholar as well as a practitioner. And, as, and, and he has carried out in recent years through his team of lawyers at the European Center of Law and Justice, tremendous uh, research on the institutions, on the human rights institutions, and some of the systemic uh, problems, including issues of bias, political bias, and undue influence within the institutions. Um, and of course, um, and so I am, I'm very happy uh, to be able to have a conversation today with him about the human rights system, about what, what is needed for the human rights system to function and as it was originally intended as a mechanism to help uh, promote human rights and bring human rights abuser, abusers um, to respect human rights. And, um, and so we wanna look at some of the problems and the, the, the issues that the human rights system is having today. And so um, having said that, I welcome you again, Gregor. Thank you again for agreeing to uh, come on this webinar with CFAM. And, um, and I, I want to start right away with, with, a, with a question, um, a hard-hitting question. We hear a lot about the human rights system. A lot of people think the human rights system is just, you know, very good. It's just um, as something unobjectionable. There, it's something that to be revered even, something to be respected at all times. And, and that's, I suppose, a good thing. That's how we want to think of the human rights system internationally. And yet we do see um, many times that UN experts overstep their boundaries and they take political positions, uh, even in, in, uh, in live political debates within countries. And so my question uh, to you to begin today is, how bad is the political bias and undue influence within the human rights system, both at the United Nations and within European institutions? Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for, for organizing this webinar. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have this discussion with you uh, and all the persons um, taking part in, uh, to this webinar. Um, Yes, it is true. The, the human rights system, um, uh, the international system uh, at the UN or the regional uh, systems uh, in Europe or in, um, in, in, in America or in Africa, uh, this system was, was aimed at uh, controlling in some extent or limiting the dangers uh, of, uh, we could say, um, democracies. Uh, limiting the dangers of elected politicians that may not respect fundamental rights and values. So the real purpose of the human rights system and the international system after war was to protect the individuals against the states, because we witnessed uh, in the 30s how much the states can be dangerous uh, against the people, can go against the people's fundamental rights and, and freedoms. So the purpose was really to control, to limit. And you're referring specifically to totalitarian regimes that appeared in Europe during the 1930s yes. years, uh, the Soviet system and the Nazi system. Exactly, um, exactly. We, we witnessed how much the state can abuse its power, uh, can have um, an immoral uh, understanding of law, can impose immoral laws, can uh, impose justice, injustice through the law, and so the purpose of the system was really to try to train the states, to control the states, to avoid that the states become a danger against its own population, its own people. So we wanted to protect the people against, against the state. Um, each time, in fact, the, the, the history of the humanity in a large extent uh, within the 
uh, under a political um, aspect has always been to try to establish institutions that can protect the common good, protect the people, uh, but without being themselves or becoming themselves a danger. Um, so we try to create a new institution, a bigger institution to control the previous one. But now we have the problem that the new institution we built after war, yes, they control in the large extent the states, but there is nobody to control those large institutions. So in some extent, we have shifted the problem, the problem of the danger of the excess of power um, is still within the states, but not only, it's also, we can also find it uh, in the sixth uh, extent um, at the uh, regional or international level. And so the uh, European institutions uh, can be as well, can become themselves a danger uh, for the freedoms uh, and the rights of the, of the individuals. And today, as a consequence, we see people um, calling for the state or for the sovereignty to protect them against the excess of the, uh, for example, uh, the European Union uh, or uh, the, uh, the UN. So it's always that's difficult. The first, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, just to interrupt you for a second, because that's just a fantastic perspective, you know, uh, because here, um, especially here in the United States, where, where, where I am, um, you know, there, there's less of that confidence in international institutions. And it, I, I love that you're speaking in the first person of how we created the human rights system to protect us from the, the excesses of power of states, of sovereign states. And uh, I, I love how now you're, you're, you've really shifted that perspective. You said, well, we originally created these human rights institutions to protect us from the power of the state. But now these human rights institutions, these international mechanisms, not just the human rights institutions, but also you know, the, the United Nations more broadly as a system, as well as the European Union and other regional mechanisms, have become a threat in and of themselves because of the power concentrated in them. Um, you know that when um, when the United States was founded, uh, that one of the founding fathers, James Madison, he had uh, he he would he was um, he had this saying that you know power corrupts and great power corrupts, um, and and uh, in some ways I, I think we are seeing this with international institutions, and and I think uh, the way you described it now now we are seeing sovereign states asking to be protected from the international institutions. So they are affirming their own sovereignty in light of the decisions of these international institutions. And this is one of the things we're seeing, for example, with Poland and Hungary, right, in, in the context of international institutions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So individuals now are calling uh, their own states to be protected from uh, the authority of the European Court of Human Rights, for example, uh, or the European Union. So it's really the, 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 the real question uh, once again, is to find the good balance of power, the good limit of power, so that the people can be respected, uh, so that um, the, uh, the, the the holder of the power, whereas it is national or international, uh, do not exceed its its power. Uh, so this is one aspect of the difficulty. The second aspect of the of the difficulty is that. Um, there are two different logics of powers. Uh, at the national level, the logic of power is based on democracy. It's based on political debate and elections. So you can have, at the national level, different opinions on what is good and just, and you can debate. But at the international level, and especially in the field of human rights, there is no such debate. There is one general philosophy of human rights, one general uh, liberal philosophy of human rights that prevails. And so at the international level, um, the political discourse is more uh, uniformed uh, and rational. It is much less based on the votes uh, or on criteriums uh, based on quantity of people who would support. It's not anymore the matter of really majority, it is more a matter of rationality that is supposed uh, to prevail. So we have on one hand a fight or an opposition between the states and the international order. And we have on the other hand also 
different of approach uh, in terms of reasoning. Uh, at the national level, it is based on votes, on discussions. And at the international level, it is based on values. And there is much less room for debate discussions. It is much more a uniformed and unique uh, and, and thinking. Where does that uniformity derive from? Where does that uniformity come from? Because you said, as you said, the, the international system, international human rights institutions seem to be dominated by a, a, a one uh, value system, only one value system, and it does not admit of any others. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's very hegemonic. Where does that value system come from? Is this where the bias that you could say that somehow the political bias comes into institutions? So, um, you know, I think, I mean, first, we are just one humanity. Uh, so we have uh, one mankind. So uh, normally there should be one justice, uh, one human nature, one anthropology. Uh, and so we would all have the same needs in some extent. So as the ideal of the international, of the international system is a universal idea, uh, ideal uh, and based on reason. And reason is, is supposed to be universal. So really, uh, all the international system of human rights is a, a, a universal ideal based on the universality of reason, human reason, uh, and uh, justice. Uh, but the where the, the, the debates, where the difficulties are coming, it is not um, because we have one vision uh, of human rights. It is more because we have conflicting understanding of the anthropology. We have conflicting visions of what is a human being. We have conflicting visions of uh, what is good for us, you know, who we are, and what is the destiny of humanity. Uh, and so we would say that we are all fighting between civilizations, between cultures, in order to impose our anthropology and through our anthropology to impose our interpretation of human rights. So the people who will have an athe a purely materialistic and atheistic anthropology will impose a materialistic and atheistic interpretation of human rights. But the people who will have a religious anthropology will have a different approach on human rights, a different interpretation. And for, of course, uh, uh, in the field, especially of natural law, uh, it will be absolutely different. So yes, there is one And system. this is where you get the disagreements about, for example, the definitions of the family. I mean, one of the things that we see here at the United Nations in New York as well in yes. Geneva all the time is, what do we mean by family? Of course, what we mean by family in, in, in the international treaties and what, what it meant 50 years ago when these international treaties were negotiated is very different from what some uh, UN member states now consider to be a family. Exactly, because uh, in 1948, even the European countries were still in large extent a Christian. So they were still sharing the Christian anthropology, the natural and objective anthropology, so everybody agreed, you know, on what is life, what is a human being, what is a family. And so, yes, it was based on a common, decent, objective anthropology that is really universal. And it is because this anthropology is true, it is universal, and therefore the human rights that are stemming from this anthropology are also just good and universal. The problem starts when some people uh, are leaving this anthropology because they, the cultures, the states uh, are becoming more materialistic or atheistic and, um, and they promote another vision. But already in 1948, you know, during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we've witnessed strong oppositions uh, between the Christian countries and the um, communist countries, Soviet countries. So already in that time, there were some um, clear opposition of anthropology and therefore of, um, of human rights. The Russian delegation, for example, opposed strongly any idea that human rights should be, um, should steam, you know, from God or, uh, or the nature. Uh, they oppose any reference to God and nature. And even for the definition of family, uh, the Russians, the Soviets, really opposed it as much as possible, whereas uh, some Christian or Catholic countries um, like uh, Lebanon or Chile 
uh, really um, asked for um, introduction of concept of natural law uh, into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, so the, what the we fascinating thing, of course, is that today the Russian Federation has a completely opposite position and now supports the language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights about the yeah. family as the natural and fundamental group unit of society. So that's a fa fascinating turnaround yeah. of events. And in 1948, Belgium and Netherlands were very conservative on those issues. That, that's mind blowing because to, nowadays they are the most progressive, uh, some of the most progressive liberal nations, including promoting an international right to abortion in, um, in United Nations meetings openly, you know, which is very, which was very rare only just 10 years ago. But it, over the last uh, five, uh, five to 10 years, we're, we've seen more and more uh, nations, as well as uh, obviously also through the human rights system and human rights experts being more aggressive in promoting issues like abortion as a human right. And, and, and where, where is this movement coming from? I mean, I, 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 want, to, I'm, I'm, I want to get to the, to the fact that there is, the international system isn't just a system that is governmental. It doesn't just involve uh, delegates and ambassadors and politicians. It also involves a network of organizations that are well-funded, often funded by governments, as well as billionaire philanthropists. And these well-funded organizations have a true influence on the international agenda, as well as the political agendas of countries, both directly and indirectly. Um, are they the ones setting the standards and how do they set these standards, these values that are uniformly accepted or um, yeah. in, in, internationally? These, you could say these alternative values that are replacing the founding values of the international system. So clearly, um, the debate at the UN is a debate of values. It's a debate of anthropology, conflicting anthropology. It's obvious. Uh, this is the main question. And it is true that uh, the, the, the stakeholders of those debates are not only the states, um, but all the, we could say, global uh, actors. Uh, what is a global actor? A global actor is an, uh, an institution that is strong enough to have a global impact. Uh, there are a number of global uh, actors among the states, but we could say that most of the states are not global actors. Most of the states are regional actors or small actors. They cannot pretend to have a global influence. But uh, aside from the states, you have also uh, companies, business companies, large companies uh, like Microsoft, for example. Uh, and you have uh, foundations uh, that are global actors. Uh, big foundations, especially American foundations, uh, like, of course, the Gates Foundation, uh, the Ford Foundation, the Open Society Foundations, uh, the Oak Foundation. There are a number of MacArthur Foundations, there are a number of American foundations, private foundations, that really want to be um, global uh, actors, want to take part into this uh, political uh, fight, uh, discussion uh, among uh, the international and regional institutions. And they have, of course, tremendous uh, budgets. So uh, we see those private actors um, based on the money, on the budget they have. It's a budget in billions often, uh, taking part into the process of the international institutions. And here we can see uh, a first uh, difficulty because of course those private actors have no legitimacy in terms of democracy. They have no legitimacy in terms of the old national politics. But as I said before, at the international level, the legitimacy does not really come from the votes. It does not really come from the democracy, it comes from the values. And so if those foundations pretend to promote the values of the international system of human rights and pretend to offer billions of dollars to support and implement this system, of course, the international public organizations will accept this support because those international organizations are missing funds very often. So they accept this private money to implement their policies. 
So we see a kind of wedding, wedding between public international organizations and private foundations collaborating together in order to uh, implement uh, some of, and often in order to decide on programs, to decide on the strategy, on the politics um, at the international level. And we can, this is a phenomenon that is very uh, massive. Uh, it is not enough uh, studied, but yeah, it is. I, I just want to. I just want to highlight something here. I mean, it really is not studied at all. And your organization, the European Center for Law, Law and Justice, has been carrying out some cutting edge work uh, in terms of uh, studying the uh, influence of uh, these uh, private uh, organizations, including the Open Society and, and such, on uh, the human rights system and uh, suggesting really that there is a, a bias and an undue influence here. But I, I just wanna highlight for those, uh, those who are watching uh, this webinar that, um, you know, because it's very difficult to think of these private foundations as something negative. You know, we think of them, especially here in the United States, we think of them as charitable enterprises. I mean, these people are giving money to essential causes to help poor people all around the world trying to save people from starvation, trying to bring development and um, infrastructure to countries that can't develop it otherwise. And so how can we think of them as, as a negative force or as having somehow a, um, um, a negative effect on the international system? And you highlighted something fu fundamental, which is they don't have so, any political legitimacy. I mean, they, yes. they only speak for their donors. And so the more influence they have on our government institutions and, and governmental institutions internationally also, that's where more scrutiny is necessary because uh, without that scrutiny, there is no one to hold them accountable in case, that there, in case there is that something that goes wrong. Um, and so uh, why, don't you, um, why don't you describe some of the work that you, you, uh, the European Center for Law and Justice and your team has been doing um, I remember a, a report in recent years you did on the European judges, the European human rights system judges, as well as yeah. on the treaty bodies. What have you been finding uh, about the influence of these uh, private actors on these human rights mechanisms? So we try to, um, so we've been working uh, within these institutions for, for almost 20 years, uh, bringing cases at the European Court of Human Rights uh, applications as well. At the UN, at the UN uh, uh, mechanism, so we, we after those years, we considered that um, there were a need also to consider um, the system itself, not only to fight within the system, but also to understand the system to see how much the system can be biased or not. Because I had suspicions uh, for years, and um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we decided to really start uh, a research and to. Uh, analyze uh, the influence of those foundations on the system at different levels. So and there so are can different you just levels. Highlight, can you just highlight some of yeah. the cases that you brought yeah. that were not successful, okay. that made you suspicious? <laughs> okay. No, in fact, you know, it's, it's uh, so for the European Court of Human Rights, uh, for example, we were very, um, you know, I was very surprised often to see how some kind of cases uh, had a very uh, fast track, uh, you know, procedure within the system, uh, within the Open Court of Human Rights, um, and that those cases were purely, purely political, uh, whereas some other good uh, cases based on justice uh, were refused by the court because the court, because maybe those cases were too conservative. So depending on the kind of case, uh, on, the, on the cause, we could see different uh, treatments um, within the court. Uh, this, I was not the only one to witness those different of treatments. And also um, I heard about um, judges uh, who were former employees uh, of um, foundations, especially the, the George Soros Open Society. And so I have seen an increasing number of judges um, that um, were uh, elected judges in Strasbourg directly from uh, an office of uh, Mr. Soros uh, Open Society. So we want now to analyze each level of influence 
Uh, I say it first, the level of influence of the global financing when foundations like the Open Society, for example, or like Microsoft uh, finance the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, for example, uh, finance uh, therefore the, the home uh, institution of the European Court of Human Rights, but they also finance uh, the home institution of the entire American Court of Human Rights. So we see this level of influence financing the international institution financing the UNICEF, financing the UNFPA, financing uh, so uh, many organizations. Uh, then uh, we saw, we witnessed um, um, institutions, foundations, fund, private foundations, getting some of their staff appointed among the judge. And we have seen that in the last 10 years, 22% of the judges of the European Court of Human Rights are coming from a few number of NGOs, all funded by Open Society. Wow, 22% of all the judges. Yeah. And that's just from the Open Society Foundation, right? Yes. But I mean, from the Open Society. The Open Society Foundation, you didn't look at other foundations. We looked to the Open Society and we looked to some other foundations that are financed by the Open Society, like the Helsinki Committees, uh, for example, or Human Rights Watch which is broadly financed by the open society, 22%. So then we saw also that those uh, judges uh, are coming from foundations that are active at the Open Court of Human Rights, which means that they bring cases to the Open Court of Human Rights. So this is another aspect. Um, imagine, Stefano, you are bringing cases uh, to the uh, Supreme Court or to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and tomorrow you become a judge before this court. What do you do? Yeah, well, you, 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 could say, you. you could say that there's a little bit of a conflict of interests or exactly. a little bit of an ethical dilemma there. Have you heard of any judges of the European Court of, court of Human Rights ever recuse themselves uh, from cases yes. like this? Because I know here in the United States, for example, the Supreme Court uh, justices will recuse themselves in cases uh, brought by their former uh, law firms, or even by, for example, I know Elena Kagan recused herself, uh, Justice Elena Kagan recused herself several times uh, from cases involving um, the, um, the Justice Department because they were cases that she worked on when she was uh, working at the Justice Department. Have you ever heard of any cases of recusal like that? Yes, yes, there are a number of, uh, we have looked at this issue. Uh, first, uh, we have to say that it's not really easy to know uh, who is behind cases. Very often, uh, foundations like the Helsinki or others uh, are supporting uh, applications case before the Open Court of Human Rights, but behind the scene. So um, it's not always obvious uh, mm -hmm. to see um, how, it's, how it is organized. But we have seen that 88 times there has been a conflict of uh, um, yes uh, a conflict of interest an obvious conflict of interest uh, within the last 10 years 88 times 88 times where the judges did not did not recuse themselves wow. and only only 12 recusals on the same period of time 12 recusals on the one hand and 88 times of non recusal so it's, it's huge. So sometimes you will um, find cases where you have a case introduced by an NGO. Uh, you have several other friendly NGOs also financed uh, by the Open Society who are third parties intervening in the case. And you have among the judges, a number of judges who are former employees of those same foundations. And so at the end, you have a group of interests that are all together uh, in the same case. Uh, and often, often, um, often you have um, those foundations employ uh, former staff of the court of, uh, so, so of human rights. So these foundations, what they're doing is they're flooding the court system with their own values and their own opinions and drowning yes. out any dissenting voices because they have so much money, because they have so much influence, they are able to simply multiply their voice like it. So it, the court has become like an echo chamber, you could say, for the yeah. uh, for the voices of only one side of a of this of these very sensitive 
uh, debates about social issues and human rights. Yes, and the court, to a large extent, uh, appreciate those foundations and NGOs because those foundations are able to bring political sensitive cases to create media attention, political campaigns, uh, press articles. Uh, so uh, the court, you know, fears in some extent to be uh, out of the society too far. And so there is a kind of collaboration between the court and those foundations. There is in fact a real collaboration between the court and those large NGOs, but only the NGOs and foundations uh, that uh, are of course um, progressive. Um, and uh, so there is, I think it's a large extent it is conscient uh, on, both, on both side. Uh, we may also say that um, those foundations are so rich uh, that in terms of uh, career, uh, career uh, it's better you know, to have good relationships uh, when you are working in the human rights field uh, with those potential uh, employers. Um, and, and yes, so it's their influence uh, goes very deep uh, into the system uh, at those um, at those different uh, different levels. Um, so at the UN, uh, we have more recently, uh, and we are going to um, to publish uh, in the coming weeks a report. We wanted, after this first research on the European Court of Human Rights, which is based in Strasbourg, we wanted to analyze uh, what is the degree of influence uh, within the uh, United Nations system. And we started um, to, um, to look at the um, mechanism, which is called special procedures. Uh, so Stefano, of course, you, you know it very well. I'm not sure if everybody knows this system. I think it's good to explain a little bit. So the United Nations has a, uh, through the Human Rights Council in Geneva, which is a body of member states, they can create uh, mandates uh, for human rights issues. Um, so they will appoint experts, human rights experts, which have a, a, portfo a specific portfolio. Like there's one uh, human rights expert which has the health portfolio and another human rights expert which has the freedom of religion and belief portfolio, and another one that has the racism portfolio. And so you have, I think, over 30 of these uh, specific human rights mandate holders, which are called special procedures. And they are sort of like roaming international experts, and they can go and make visits to countries and create reports, or they can create generic reports, thematic reports um, that cover the entire world. And it inevitably, uh, these reports that we have seen at, Center for, at the Center for Family and Human Rights, they uh, systematically promote abortion, they systematically promote um, the redefinition of the family international, the LGBT rights, uh, other controversial issues, um, including surrogacy even uh, uh, internationally. Um, and so, um, and so uh, it's very interesting to us that you have actually carried out uh, a, a study similar to what you did with the European um, human rights system uh, to see who, who is actually influencing the special procedures to advance this agenda. Yes, so uh, those people are, so as you said, are international experts. Um, they are supposed not to, to be paid by the UN. Uh, they work normally pro bono uh, and uh, they um, are paid only for their um, travels, two travels per year. Uh, plus uh, one travel in Geneva and one travel uh, in New York. Uh, what we have seen is and that the point in the of last, this is to preserve uh, their independence, of course. The exactly. point of, of not compensating the experts is because they uh, trot around the world saying that they are independent experts, human rights experts, and they, don't, they, they are not influenced by any country. Yes, they are supposed not to be influenced by any country. They are supposed to be independent. They have an important, um, we could say, um, uh, political uh, authority and legal authority on the interpretation of human rights. So they are very important people. Uh, what we have seen is that of, in the last years, uh, we have studied um, all the budgets uh, of the system as much as it is public um, in the last five years. And we have seen uh, that those experts uh, are receiving uh, millions uh, of uh, dollars uh, from outside the uh, UN system. 
um, they have a normal budget, a usual budget, an ordinary budget from the UN system, which is about uh, 12 million per year. Uh, and in addition, uh, those experts allowed themselves to receive uh, millions of dollars from states uh, and uh, from uh, private foundations and Ford Foundation, as well as anonymous um, donations, uh, as well millions of dollars of anonymous donations uh, that they use to um, accomplish their, their mandate. Uh, so this is very problematic. Uh, because, uh, of course, it endangers the independence uh, of the uh, UN experts because they are not supposed to receive money. Um, they are supposed only to work with the official UN money, not uh, with money from governments uh, or even from uh, private uh, foundations. Um, so they explain that they need more money to accomplish their mandate. This may, of course, be true in a certain extent. But some, um, some mandate orders um, really um, are um, collecting a lot, a lot uh, of, of, of money to, to, to accomplish a mandate. Uh, there is real lack of transparency. There is no obligation, uh, no real obligation to publish uh, the money received, uh, to declare it. Uh, it is only, we could say, a moral obligation, but not a legal obligation. So many experts don't really uh, publish what they uh, collect, what they receive. They don't explain always who gives the money. They don't explain what the money is for. Um, and uh, they don't um, mention. So they don't, uh, when they they don't they... say if there's any earmarks. So, for example, no. you know, if the Netherlands were to give money to the rapporteur on the right to health to promote an international... Um, rights to abortion, there would be no way of knowing it. Uh, there would Some... be no way of knowing it, where the money came from and uh, for what specific project. It is only based on the uh, free declaration of the experts. If the experts wants to declare it, they can do it. But most of the time, they just uh, say, uh, received a grant from Netherlands. And they don't wow. say the amount. They don't say why, or they will say received $200,000 cash from anonymous donor. Wow. <laughs> or sometimes they don't even say. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's so, uh, so this is, and they, they don't have any duty to declare. So we know there are some experts that received uh, important uh, support from private and public actors. But those, experts, we can see they don't de even declare those support. Sometimes if you compare uh, the um, database of the Open Society grant system with the, uh, uh, the declarations of the experts, on the one hand, you will have the Open Society saying, or the four foundations saying that they gave, for example, uh, $200,000 to one expert. And the same expert will just declare 5,000. Oh, wow. Wow. So there are differences. differences so so you, you, have, you had a forensic accounting uh, investigation, basically, on all these foundations and, and the human rights system. I think, I think some folks at the State Department, if anybody from the State Department is listening, uh, the U.S. State Department, that is, would be very interested in talking to you because they're always trying to figure out where the money is going. And uh, it sounds like you 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 figured something out. <laughs> so we we compared we compared the budget um, the declar the different declarations of the experts annual declaration of the expert the annual uh, declaration of the high commissioner of the office of the high commissioner and um, the um, database of Ford uh, Open Society and a bit of some other smaller foundations um, as well as some universities. And so we can see you know, what is declared on one side, what is declared as received on the other side. Um, and we can really see there is a, an important lack of rigor. It is not rigorous at all. Um, so the figures, uh, hello, are you here? Yeah, yeah. yeah we just the figures are not, second there. Yeah, the, the figures are, are not um, coherent. 
um, but uh, this lack of coherency is uh, important itself. So this is what we have seen, uh, direct financing. Uh, there is a problem of transparency. Uh, there is no obligation uh, to publish. Um, there is a problem, of course, also of independence because we have, um, in addition, wrote to uh, 130 and 30 um, experts and former experts to ask for discussion. Uh, 36 uh, answered, and we had at the end uh, 28 um, interviews with experts and former experts. Uh, each wow. interview was about an hour, an hour of interview with 28 experts, and so they, we asked openly questions about the system and the financing. Uh, and many experts uh, recognize the problem. They say that the money never comes for free. They say that very often uh, the money uh, is proposed for a specific program or project. So um, a state, for example, uh, will come with a proposal uh, or a foundation will come with a proposal and will come and see an expert and say, listen, uh, you are, this was an example given by one of the experts. You are the expert on torture. Um, why don't you uh, do a report on uh, gender and torture? And I will support, I will be happy to support your work. I will provide you with uh, enough money to do your consultations, uh, to do, um, you know, to travel and so on. Uh, and of course, it's interesting uh, for the expert to have so much support, uh, to be able to organize press conferences or conferences with academics, publications, access to media, and so on, uh, and staff. I mean, there's a self-interest there. I mean, if, if once you become part of the human rights system, if you are become one of these experts, um, there's a there's a very big incentive to maximize the use of the office in order to raise your own profile as an expert internationally. Because even if you're not compensated for your work, uh, your status as an expert uh, is sig significantly advanced. Yes, you don't want to waste your time. You want to accomplish something, you need support, you need more staff than the staff provided by the UN uh, High Commissioner. Uh, so you, you, you will be ready to, to collaborate. You will need, many experts say I have no choice, uh, but the problem is you know, who will give the money, what for, uh, in which extent the government or the foundation will clearly uh, ask for um, specific work to be done. We have seen you know, uh, in the, um, a database of the Open Society or the Ford Foundation, they clear, clearly write in, you know, um, a grant of one hundred thousand uh, dollar in order to influence. It's written to influence. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're not even being coy about it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> in order to influence the uh, the experts, you know, it was on uh, on uh, equality on women, women equality. Uh, and uh, in order to have some specific uh, report written um, uh, on the uh, issue of, of equality and, um, and uh, women, women's rights. Um, and we could see how uh, this purpose of donation um, uh, succeeded because uh, the money was given first uh, from the Open Society or the Ford, no, I think the Ford Foundation to uh, a private um, uh, institution belonging to a university in the US, uh, which is a feminist uh, foundation, uh, institution, uh, which is itself uh, staffed with some uh, UN staff or former uh, UN experts. Um, and this uh, academic, but uh, uh, it's, not really, it's not really academic, it's really a advocacy organization, lobbying organization uh, with the UN, depending on the university, um, use the money to provide to the experts with reports, travels, uh, consultations, and so on. And the, the year following the grant of the $100,000, the thematic report of the experts was precisely uh, on the topic uh, of the um, subject of the grant. And uh, we could see after a while how this uh, NGO uh, managed to um, 
to help and uh, go along with the expert, you know, in the writing and in the promotion of the report. So we can really see how it is implemented. Um, and some ex we have some examples of clear um, implementations from the ground to the promotion of the final report. Just, uh, a, just a question, because there may be somebody skeptical who's listening now, and they may be saying, oh, but this is all organic. This is not programmed. This is all these developments happened organically because everybody is promoting uh, the same values uh, internationally. And what, I, what's, what, what I'm getting from, from what your uh, report gets at is that, no, it's actually coordinated. Everything from, from how the accounting is done to the media strategies later when the reports are finally issued, everything is being coordinated. I mean, uh, we can see uh, successful uh, advocacy strategies. I mean, you are working for a large foundation you want to promote an idea, uh, for example, that the idea that domestic work is a kind of slavery. This is one of the ideas that was promoted by those foundations. You say, okay, I'm ready to spend uh, 100 or $200,000 for that. Uh, I will propose uh, first an NGO or university who is hiring uh, experts of the UN, or I will propose directly the experts of the UN uh, to dedicate its uh, next uh, thematic report on this issue, and I will offer support, staff, uh, media, and so on. Um, and yes, I discussed with experts who clearly said I had an agreement, a grant agreement with the Open Society or with the Ford Foundation, and I have some obligations. For example, I have the obligations to publish a book uh, on such topic. Uh, you know, so yes, when you wow. receive, what, now if you receive large amount of money, you have uh, obligations. So you have a grant agreement. That's fascinating. That I, I, we, we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, you have to explain what? Yeah, you hear me? Yes, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. So I, I just want to get to a couple of things here. Um, so two things. One is, why should we even worry about these special procedures or the human rights system overall? After all, it's, af it's, it's mostly hortatory, right? I mean, we here in the United States just see it as something distant. It has nothing to do with us. These human rights, rights experts have outrageous opinions anyways. They promote prostitution. They attack uh, circumcision as a, as a human rights abuse. And they have all these weird and eccentric uh, opinions. Why should we even pay attention to them? And, and, and that's one question. And then the other question is, what can we do to make the system better? What can we do to institute? Is it political controls? Is it outside mechanisms? Is it a ref institutional reform? Because I know, for example, for the special procedures, they do have a code of conduct that they adopted themselves. The special procedures have a code of conduct um, according to which they should be operating. Of course, the code of conduct is ignored or it's ineffective because it's obviously not, not, uh, not, not able to prevent the, these problems. Um, so what can we, what can we do? Uh, two things, why should we be worried about this undue influence and, and why the human rights system matters? And what can we do to make it better? Okay, so first about the, can you, uh, yes, I mean, about the influence, uh, the influence is very important. They are, um, they, contribute to the um, formation of international law. Uh, they contribute to the doctrine. Um, they contribute to the reason. As I said, there is a reasonable, rational, rational discourse um, at the international level. Uh, and so they are the ones who uh, create new norms at the international level. They are also very often quoted by jurisdictions. Uh, there are hundreds of cases at the Open Court of Human Rights, for example, that are quoting reports from the UN. We have even found uh, reports uh, funded by the Ford Foundation or the Open Society Foundation quoted by the European Court of Human Rights as references. Wow. Or quoted by- or, They, they or didn't quoted even by funnel the, them through the special procedures. They just quoted directly from the Open Society. <laughs> <laughs> and also quoted you know, as the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights. 
So, of course, those reports have an important uh, influence on international law and, at, at the end, on our legal systems. Um, so, what should we do? The first thing to do, I think, is first to open the eyes to see, uh, you know, that human rights are not coming from, you know, the sky. Uh, human rights are the result of um, influences, uh, fights, influences, um, and we have to expose uh, the system. We have to, uh, I think what we can do today, what we have to do today is to first open the eyes, see uh, these uh, mechanism of influence, uh, then uh, analyze it uh, with, uh, you know, very, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, very seriously um, and expose it. Uh, it has results. Uh, in Strasbourg, our report on the European Court of Human Rights already had excellent uh, results. For example, for the first time, a new uh, candidate uh, coming from the Open Society was not elected uh, judges, was rejected uh, as judges uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. And there are discussions um, among uh, the uh, ambassadors in Strasbourg, some governments spoke um, openly about the report and support it. So uh, yes, uh, we have to do this work. We have to open the eyes to analyze it, uh, to expose those uh, mechanisms of influence, to clean the system. We need to uh, clean the system from uh, those uh, undue, um, undue influence. This is the first uh, thing we have to do. And, uh, and then at a political level, so I, I know, I mean, I find, uh being in this line of work, I find it one of the most frustrating things is people are not aware of the abuses of the human rights system. You know, everybody looks to the human rights system with starry eyes and also to these foundations. They don't see any impropriety, any, any political undue influence there. And uh, so I, I totally agree that the number one task has to be to inform the public about what is actually happening in these institutions. And, and so I know that you have been working to publish this report um, and have, has it received any media cover? Do you plan to, to is, is there a media strategy to, to inform the public with regards to, to what's happening with the special procedures? Yes, yes. So it will be um, published in, first in French um, by the end of the week, at the end of this week. Um, yes, there will be um, a large media uh, coverage uh, first in French, and in the following weeks, uh, and mainly in September, uh, we will launch uh, the report uh, also in English. And yes, the last, the previous report on the ECHR, on the European Court of Human Rights, um, provoked hundreds of articles, hundreds of press articles uh, across the globe in, the, in America, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe. So yes, it provoked uh, very important media coverage, and I'm, I, I guess I guess this report uh, will also attract a lot of attention. Of course, our first or main purpose is to send it to the ambassadors um, of the um, uh, present in Geneva uh, at the UN uh, to share it with the experts. Many experts want are waiting for our report uh, to read it. So we want first to address uh, the system. We want then secondly to have this report known publicly. Um, but, um, but I'm sure uh, the content of the report itself uh, is important enough to, to create the, um, the attention. Uh, but there are also some media uh, that who, who do not share uh, our concerns or who share uh, the uh, approaches of those large foundations, those large progressive uh, foundations might, might they be also uh, receiving some money from those large foundations yes exactly also media who don't want to speak about it uh, because of course it would go against their own interest uh, so it's, it was very interesting the previous report to see which media were courageous and free enough uh, to speak about about it uh, but really um, it was a, it has a huge impact um, and i think it's important to to uh, as I said, you know, to, to see the reality. Um, human rights do not come from the sky. You know, it's not a revelation. Uh, it is a result of, uh, of influences, of conflicts, of debates. Uh, and we need to have a system that is honest, that is not captured uh, by some, by some uh, private um, interest. Um, and so I think this is uh, 
part of the work we, we must we have to do uh, for us to be realistic. We don't want to be naive. You know, we don't want to to work naively within the system, ignoring how much biased it can be. That that's that's great. That that you to end on that note. I I, I hear there's a. I've been looking at some of the questions in the in the question and answer box, and uh, one of one of the questions is: So, are are you saying this is from Betty Smith? Is she saying? Are you saying that human rights experts are not helpful, or the system of appointing them? It seems that human rights experts are actually needed, and and, and this is exactly what we're saying here. Yes, human rights experts are needed, um, uh, to the degree that they they fulfill a mandate that respects um, uh, legitimate. Uh, uh, sovereign uh, debates about social policy issues. But the moment when uh, you have an international system that takes its, um, oversteps its bounds and uh, does things which it's not su supposed, uh, was not created to do, including promoting specific political agendas and acting in a partisan way, then it, it's, it's no longer uh, defending universal values. It's only advancing one one uh, one set of values and it's being used in a political way and that's exactly what the the human rights system was created to avoid it was created to avoid one side of a political debate crushing another and um and so um it's essential to eliminate biases it's essential to, it's essential to combat it to the degree that we can as as um as gregor was saying to clean the system to clean the system, we see that there's a lot of, of problems within the systems. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I want to I want to just leave everybody with one final thought. Once we do create uh, awareness, once we do create, um, how how can we go about remedying the system? Is it something that that has to come from ambassadors, from foreign ministries, or is it something that has to come more from a grassroots political level? Um, we at CFAM, we are always interested in this because we know that to get results, you have to work at all levels. Um, and so what, what, I, I, what do you think is essential in terms of, of getting results to change the special, special procedures, uh, as well as the human rights system more broadly? Is it just something to have to do with international institutions resolving their issues within themselves? Or is there a larger political debate that has to take place at the national level? Um, how do you see that? Okay, um, various, uh, so your question is very broad. Um, what I can say is that in terms of politics, there is no final solution. Uh, it's always a dynamic reality. So, you know, the humanity tries always to find proper uh, problems. Uh, we need to, to clarify it, to, to, to answer, to save those problems. It is our role as an NGO to, to clean the system, to denounce it when it's uh, going wrong. Uh, I have to say that a number of experts uh, I discussed with are very happy about this report. You know, they are support the report because they, they know the system has to be uh, clean, as they know this issue has to be addressed. Um, so, um, so it is positive work that we are doing uh, for the system. Uh, there is no, yes, a final, uh, final solution. Um, but more generally, um, uh, what is important uh, for all of us um, is to uh, really decide if we want to have a political future that is based on democracy or that is based on values, abstract values, universal values. Um, this is really today's discussion. Um, we can see this conflict in Europe, as you say, between Poland, Hungary, and, and the EU. Uh, of course, the problem is that those values, those universal values we are discussing, speaking about today, they are in large majority um, atheistic values, uh, materialistic values, values that, of course, are contrary uh, to the ones who uh, share a religious understanding of the human being, and especially a Christian uh, faith and understanding of the human being. So we, we have this choice, this fundamental choice to, to make uh, between a kind of abstract universal uh, dream of society uh, sharing va values. And this is more and more 
the system that is supported by the international institutions, or um, on the other hand, conserving in some extent the democracy, the vote, the political freedom, uh, so that we stay uh, more free. There is one thing that is important. Um, when you consider to have found the truth in politics, you don't need any more freedom. In politics, if you have the truth, you don't need any more freedom uh, because the freedom in politics is used to uh, find the truth. Um, and so we are today in this situation where a number of actors, global actors, consider that they have found the, ult the ultima, ultima ratio, uh, the truth of the system, you know, the values, the universal values, the true universal values, and they don't need any more democracy. Uh, because democracy even more is a danger because it can go goes against those, the implementation of those values and it is very difficult you know uh, to make the good choice uh, but uh, i will speak as a christian of course i like the idea of universal values because i believe they do exist uh, but the problem is that uh, most of the time the universal values that are promoted by uh, current uh, international institutions people uh, are not the ones uh, of the Christianity. Uh, on some extent, they uh, diverge when we are speaking about natural law, about protection of life and family and, and so on. Uh, so we have this uh, difficult choice, but once again, there is no um, final solution in politics. It is a dynamic reality. We have to, to do our work during our life to have a good and balanced system, but there will be never any final solution. And, and on that note, I, we want to conclude today and we want to thank all our participants for, uh, for uh, listening in. I want to thank you, Gregor, again, for all your work you're doing to defend life and family internationally, to defend the integrity of human rights. Um, I'm always impressed every time I talk to you and every, anytime I hear anything coming out of the European Center for Law and Justice, uh, you do such amazing and important work. And um, if you would like to catch this webinar, if you have only just tuned in recently, and if you would like to catch a, a, the recording, it will be available on CFAM's YouTube page. And um, I would invite you to please, uh, if you enjoyed the webinar, to support CFAM, also support the European Center for Law and Justice, uh, if you have the means. Thank you very much. And until next time. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregor. Merci.